All right, chapter one has to do with matter, and it's going to be a short overview video just covering the basics of the lecture material. Now, atoms and molecules, compounds, we're going to be learning the difference between these. So atoms are the fundamental unit, the, the individual, undivisible, indivisible part uh, molecule or individual uh, particle. Molecule is two or more of these atoms that are chemically attached. The compound is two or more different elements. So two or more atoms of different elements that are chemically bound together. So um, there's small distinctions between all of these. And chemistry is the basic science. Um, the hypothesis is a tentative interpretation. Uh, when you get a lot of these interpretations together and create a general explanation, you get a theory. Once this theory is tested in different scenarios by different scientists all over the world, you get a scientific law. So some practice there. Classification of matter. There's two different uh, classifications of matter. We talk about the state and we talk about its composition. Composition meaning the chemical makeup of the matter. And the state, not New Jersey or New York, but its physical state. Meaning is it a solid? Is it a liquid? Is it a gas? Is it a plasma? But um, we are just going to talk about solid, liquid, and gas. So during class, we'll talk more about this chart. But basically, as you increase the energy of particles in a sample, it increases their degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom corresponds to the state of matter that they're in. So for example, low energy, cold particles are going to be solid. And like in water, it's going to be ice. Then as you increase the temperature or increase the energy, you then reach a threshold, which is called the melting point, which then the ice begins to melt and forms water, which has more flow and more degrees of freedom than the ice. If you continue to add energy to these particles, you then have water, you excite the water, the molecules begin to move faster, and they create a water and steam mixture when you reach the boiling point. Above the boiling point, when every particle has reached the boiling point and gone above it, you have created gas. Gas has the highest degree of freedom, and those gas molecules are allowed to go up, down, left, right, and fill whichever container they're in. They are not bound by the volume of the liquid, but they're bound by the volume of the container. So that's basically what I said. We'll be talking about different types of solids, crystalline solids versus amorphous solids, which do not have any recognizable pattern, like crystalline solids, which we'll learn in chapter 14. They have a specific lattice structure that is specific to the type of compound or molecule that is forming the solid. We have liquid matter, gaseous matter. We talked about the degrees of freedom already. Um, now we're going to classify matter by being a pure substance or a mixture. So a pure substance are, can either be elements on the periodic table or compounds of combinations of elements in the periodic table. Mixtures, we can be either homogeneous or heterogeneous. Homogeneous being the same throughout, such as a metal alloy. Heterogeneous being different throughout, such as a salad or sand and water or sand and gravel or whatever this is. Um, or sand and gold in this case, um, but it is heterogeneous, meaning it is different in composition throughout the mixture. So we have elements, compounds, transforming matter. We can transform matter um, with a physical or a chemical change. Now, a physical change is when the composition, meaning the chemical composition, whether it's H2O or CO2 or, or sulfur, is not changed. We are just talking about the physical state of the matter and the shape. So the state, meaning if water is melted or water is frozen or water is boiled, um, those are physical changes, a change of state. Also, if you take a piece of paper, you cut it in half, that is also a physical change. A chemical change, on the other hand, is a completely new chemical substance being formed from the combination or decomposition of other chemical substances. And an example of that is sodium metal and chlorine gas going together to make sodium chloride. It is a completely new substance, and this can only be reversed by chemical methods. And you need to know the chemical composition of the substances in order to make those chemical changes. Physical changes, you do not need to know the chemical makeup of the material. And rusting is a great, rusting, burning, those are key words that we talk about when we mention chemical changes. Um, physical changes, we talk sublimating, which is going from a solid directly to a gas. Um, dissolving, that's just changing from a solid to an aqueous solution, meaning it's in a water-based solution. 
Um, burning is a chemical change. It's, it's a, you're taking oxygen, putting it into the reaction of whatever's burning, and the output is CO2 and H2O. So energy is the capacity to do work. Work is by definition of physics, the force that you put on an object over a distance. And it depends on how big the object is, on how heavy it is, it's mass. So um, that's an important definition. We have two types of energies, kinetic and potential. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with the motion. And it depends on the velocity. So uh, one half mv squared is the physics definition of kinetic energy. And examples of this are thermal energy and electric energy, where you have some kind of current or there's movement involved. Uh, potential energy is a energy associated with the positions of an object or the composition of an object, meaning the chemical bonds that have energy, either repulsive or attractive forces within the chemical bond itself. In examples of this, you have chemical bond energy, it's written right here, and nuclear energy, where the positions themselves create unstable nuclei, which then can release or have the potential to release a large amount of energy, converting that potential energy to kinetic. So all we're doing here with any chemical motion or any, any energetic motion is we are converting potential energy, which is why they call it potential, to kinetic energy. And we have two types of properties when we're talking about different units of measurement. We have extensive property, properties and intensive properties. Extensive properties mean it depends on the amount of matter. So, for example, work, where you're pushing an object. The work is going to be larger if you, have, if you need to create more of a force. And force is dependent on the mass of the object. Um, intensive properties do not depend on the amount of object present. So we talked about mass and volume. Uh, so mass, mass is a mass and volume are extensive properties, meaning um, based on the amount of object is there, it is going to be more or less mass and more or less volume. Density. So density is mass over volume. So um, you have two extensive properties divided by one another. This makes an intensive property because if the mass of something is large and the volume of something is large, it will then have that density, that specific density. And if the mass is small, the volume would be small. The density doesn't change depending on how much substance you have. For example, water's density is one gram per milliliter. And this is constant no matter how much water you have. And in terms of density, it's important to note that solids have a large density because you're having a lot of particles compacted into a small amount of space. Liquids also have a relatively large density, but it's usually less than solids. And then gases have the lowest density because those molecules are spread in a large volume container, whether if I breathe, those molecules are being spread out through the room. Except ice. Ice is a weird scenario. So ice and water does not follow this rule. Liquid water is more dense than solid ice. And you can, you can see this happen if you were to freeze a water bottle. If you freeze a water bottle and forget about it, it actually expands. The water bottle could break the plastic. The reason why that happens is because once the water freezes, it creates a lattice. So it is a crystalline solid. It creates this lattice of hydrogen bonded water molecules, which actually increases the distance between the water molecules to create this rigid structure. And what that does is it actually increases the volume of the ice. That's why ice can uh, float on liquid water. And that's why ice cubes float in your drink, because the ice cubes have the same amount of water molecules spread along a larger distance, meaning the density is lower. Liquids, they're kind of closer together. The hydrogen bonds are constantly being broken and formed, and there's more energy to keep those hydrogen bonds breaking and forming because liquids are at a higher energy state than solids. So that's an important exception to note. So there's some densities. There's a question you do in class. Another question you do in class, precision accuracy. Um, so precision is how repeatable a measurement is. Sometimes in chemistry and in biochemistry, we have experiments where they can uh, be precise, but not accurate. So I keep getting the same wrong answer 10 times in a row. That means it may be something with my experimental method, or it may be the instrument itself. Um, accuracy is how close to the real or true value you are. So you can be very precise, but not accurate. But you can't really be accurate, really accurate without being precise. What you can say is, oh, 
I picked, I, let's say, um, let's say the, the one on the left here, right? So the one on the left in purple, the, the bullseye, let's say the, the bullseye is the intended target. Um, these, if you average all of these points out, they're all over the place, but you can say the average of them may be somewhere in the middle. That's not accurate. Even though the average is somewhere in the middle and, oh, the average is accurate, well, the standard deviation is pretty large. That means it's not a true scientific value and you cannot use that. So the, science, the deviation would be larger than the actual range of the, of, the, of the sample or it would be equal to the range, which is not good for science at all. Um, there's different errors. There's random error like there is on the left and there's systematic error, which is in B. And then obviously C is the intention where you want all of your values of your measurements to be on target. Uh, so accuracy versus precision, that's just more examples of that. Um, the different methods of separating liquids, we'll talk about that as liquids and solids. We will talk about that during class. Uh, measurements, we have length, we have mass, we have time, we have temperature, and there's different units of measurement. You have the SI units, which are the chemistry international units, which we're going to be learning about in this class. And then we have the American units, which is the imperial system. And then you have the metric system, which is closely related, but not exactly the same as the SI units. One unit is the same throughout all of them, and that is time. So seconds, minutes, hours, every country in the world works in seconds, minutes, and hours. If you didn't, all your flights would be screwed up and you'd have a big problem. Um, temperature is different in all three uh, because you have Kelvin, you have Celsius, you have uh, Fahrenheit for the imperial units. Uh, so you have mass, you have length. Um, and then we have time, so there's time, uh, temperature, the temperature uh, calculations and equations will be given on the exam going from Celsius to Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit to Celsius, you can just in, in, undo that. Um, and then when we're talking about Kelvin to, or Celsius to Kelvin on the next slide, you only want to add your 273.15, which is your magic number, and it's the difference between Celsius and Kelvin. There's the same exact scale. It's just shifted up into the absolute temperature scale. Prefix multipliers, I would say it's important to know nano all the way up to giga. Nano is a billion. Micro is a millionth of something. Milli is a thousandth. Centi is a tenth, or sorry, hundredth. Deci is a tenth. Kilo is a thousand, mega like megabyte is a million, giga like gigabyte is a billion of something. So I would say we need to use those. Um, derived units, you can derive volume and density, and density is usually in grams per milliliter. Now significant figures, these are kind of a pain, but we're gonna learn them. For significant figures, the most important thing for measuring significant figures is in this case, we have a burette. And when we have liquid to a tick mark, we want to accurately measure up to the tick mark and also one digit beyond the tick mark. So in this example with this burette, we have 20 to 21. It goes downwards opposite. So it's the amount of liquid that is expelled from the burette. From t it's at least 20.1 something. So that 20.1 are called certain digits. If we take one digit beyond that and make it 20.1 something, that something is the uncertain digit. And you're allowed to have one uncertain digit per calculation or per measurement, sorry. So in this case, a good estimate would be 20.14, 20.15, 20.16. Those are all equally valid measurements. So that's important for when you're measuring. It's only one digit beyond the tick mark. For the rules of significant figures, we want to state that all non-zero digits are significant, all of the interior sandwich zeros are significant, and the leading zeros of a leading zeros and trailing zeros, some are significant, some are not. Leading zeros are meaning the zeros in the beginning of a number, if there are any, are always not significant. In this number right here, 0 0.001050, it has four significant figures. Because it has the decimal, and regardless if it had the decimal or not, the leading zeros are always insignificant. The trailing zeros, on the other hand, the one zero that comes at the end of the number, is significant only if there is a decimal. Because it states that, because that decimal is there, we know this is a measured number, and it's not a counted number. So for example, if you had 100 things that you counted, it's not 100.0 things you counted, it's 100. But in this case, because of the presence of the decimal, we can say that the measurement was into that zero mark. 
and it wasn't a five, it wasn't a six, it wasn't a seven, it was measured as a zero. That is why the trailing zeros when there are decimals present are significant. So another thing is an example that's 150, this is a counted number because it does not have a decimal. If it's 150 point, then it would be three sig figs. Now, sig figs operations, addition and subtraction, just for the short-winded explanation, the, we're looking at the numbers and significant, or really the numbers in total after the decimal place. For example, in the first thing, we have two decimal places with the first number and then three decimal places with the other two numbers, meaning your answer has to be in the least number of decimal places, so the least accurate values. The least accurate values places. So it would be two decimal places for the first one. The second number, you have one decimal place on the first number and two on the second. Um, for a mul so it'd be the answer would have to be rounded to one. Multiplication and division, it's this, the total number of significant figures in the number. So it is the, we, the result and the answer is the same number as significant figures, of significant figures as the fewest number of significant figures in the measurement. So the first one, it would have to be in two sig figs. The second one with the division has to be in three sig figs because that is the least amount. When you are adding two volumes or doing anything with these numbers that you are measuring directly, again, you use the certain and uncertain digits and then add them up as you were would normally. Complex operations, if you were to do several multiplication and addition or subtraction operations, you're doing them in PEMDAS, in order of operations, and you're using the rules for significant figures in those operations on each step, one at a time. And the answer follows those steps as well. A conversion is the last thing that we're gonna cover. And if you were to convert 4.2 inches to centimeters, we first need a conversion factor. For all conversion problems, we need a conversion factor. So 4.2 inches, we know that one inch is 2.54 centimeters. Therefore, 4.2 inches times 2.54 centimeters per inch, the inches will cancel out and the answer will be in centimeters. So you the given units will cancel out, the desired unit will end up in the numerator and this will give you the answer. If you were to use proper significant figures, which you always should, and you will be tested on this on the exam for proper sig figs, the answer would be 11. For the next one, we are given the conversion of um, liters to quarts, but we're looking for milliliters to quarts. So 30 milliliters is 30 divided by 1,000 liters. So what you can do is you can take 30 divided by 1,000 to get to liters, take the liters, multiply it by 1.057 quarts per one liter in order to get your quarts as your desired unit outcome. And that is exactly what we do here. You can use density as a conversion factor, the grams per centimeter cubed or grams per milliliter of a substance. You can find out how many milliliters a certain different number of grams can take up or find using the volume, find out how much does that weigh in terms of grams. So here we're gonna do some other examples throughout the lecture. Um, if you have a unit conversion of raised to a power, such as inches cubed or cubic inches to cubic centimeters, the relationship between normal inches and normal centimeters has to be converted by cubic. So it would not be one inch cubed equals 2.54 centimeters cubed. No, it would be one cubic inch equals 2.54 to the third cubic centimeters. And that would be 16.4 cubic centimeters equals one cubic inch. Keep, make sure to keep that in mind and there will be examples of that on the homework assignments. And we'll be doing more of those um, throughout the lecture and um, we'll end on there. So be sure to comment if you have any questions um, and be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.